My name is Jenna Taylor. I'm the newest member of the Google Food team here in Mountain View, and I am delighted to be your facilitator for today's talk at Google. We're very lucky to be joined this afternoon by James Beard Award winner for Best Chef California, San Francisco Magazine's Chef of the Year, Chef Michael Minna. As many of you guys know, uh, Chef Minna is the founder of The Minna Group, a restaurant management company operating 26 restaurants mm -hmm. around the, the country. And joining Chef Minna today is Minna Group president, Patrick Yimmel. <laughs> Mr. Yimmel started working with Chef Minna in 1999 and has since helped grow the brand from four restaurants to 26. Clearly, it's a magical partnership. Thank you both so much. <laughs> Thank you. For Thank, being you for, with Thank you for having us today. Us. Thank you. Uh, I know I have some questions based on my having followed your career uh, and your Instagram, frankly, for <laughs> some time. And then we would love to open it up to questions from the audience as well. Right? Sound good? Great. 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 So you've always got something new going on. You guys have mm -hmm. all these restaurants and concepts. Maybe tell us a little bit about your newest project. Sure. Um, well, it, our newest project last year we did. Um, last year we opened nine restaurants in a ten-month period, and it was and and they were fairly significant restaurants, and not just restaurants. We actually did a market um, in St. Petersburg, and so this year um, we our focus was to really launch this what we were calling a test kitchen, but we wanted to to take a much different approach. Um, with the test kitchen, we didn't um, really want to just create a place to go and test recipes and create dishes and then put them in restaurants. We wanted the test kitchen to serve um, a few different purposes. And um, the, the, really the first purpose was not just to test dishes. We wanted to get a lot more out of it, which was test concepts, test a complete concept, be able to take a concept, do it. And, and in this day and age, with the way pop-ups have gone, and the ability to say, OK, today this restaurant is going to be this concept. Um, so we, we um, found a perfect scenario in the sense that it was a neighborhood restaurant. We really felt a lot of our restaurants are, are they're, you know, they're large restaurants, and they're usually in, in major cities. Um, a lot, obviously, here in the Bay Area is our home. But we wanted this to be in a neighborhood, so we found a um, uh, re we found a restaurant space that was already built out in a little building that that we could buy, and we created um, what we're calling the the Mina Test Kitchen, um, and then you know, it's just going to continually change concepts, and it's on Greenwich and uh, Greenwich and Fillmore, so it's you know kind of right down in Cal Hollow um, neighborhood, close to where Patrick lives, and it's like 45 seats. And it has a great little kitchen in it. And so we're doing, try, doing a concept, naming the concept, and running it for three months. The first concept is, gonna, is called Middle Terranean. And so it's, um, it's Mediterranean and the Middle East. And I'm, I was born in Egypt. And so um, it's, and my uh, chef, the corporate chef, who's um, kind of our partner in this whole thing, he's, um, uh, he has a lot of Israeli background. And so what we're doing is really creating this first concept. It's a pop-up. And what we'll do is we'll run it for three months. Um, we run it four nights a week and get real feedback. And, um, and then three months later, we'll kind of redecorate a little and, and launch another concept. On the other days that we're not running it, those are days that we'll be testing dishes for the other restaurants. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. Innovation, kind of pushing the pushing the envelope with a new idea. That's certainly something that resonates, I think, with, with it, Googlers. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because when you really think about it, it's something that could never have been done ten years ago. Because yeah. without all of the everything that's out there, the ways to communicate what you're doing, you know, um, we were laughing about it because the other day, because what you were saying, like with Instagram and Facebook and and Twitter and all the different avenues you have now to get the word out. That's what you, you could have never done something like this, you know, 10 years ago as a restaurateur, because really the only way you were going to get a message out to somebody was very that, that traditional PR, you know, go out, PR a restaurant for a year, open it up. And then the only photos anybody's ever going to see is when you're reviewed or, I know, and now it's just obviously instantaneous what you can do and how you can message what you're doing by the minute. Um, 
as, as opposed to you know, um, really not having, really giving people access to what you're doing, what you're changing. So for us, it's going to be fun because each week we can create new dishes. And then ultimately, the goal is within three months to have a complete menu to take that restaurant, if we like it, and then go open it someplace else. And then you have a little bit of a fan base built right. in. So that's you're like it. getting a head start on opening a, a real concept. Yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. That's very exciting. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing that I find fascinating about your guys' company and partnership is that the way you've found success with <coughs> so many different concepts in different locations. <laughs> Can you talk to us a little bit about what are those core threads that, that bind amongst all of your, your restaurants? Why do you think they're all successful? Mm -hmm. I think, you know, although there's a lot of different restaurants, it's really, it's one thing. It's understanding culture through food. And for us, we, we love to discover, we love to explore, we love to travel, we love to connect to, to people, to societies, to the civilizations. And so, you know, we love to kind of go to Japan and understand um, the history of Japan and understand how society works in Japan by going to different restaurants and eating. It's the one common thread that exists throughout every culture, uh, throughout every society. Everybody has to sustain themselves. Everybody has to nourish themselves. They have to eat. They have to come together, whether it's independently or as a family. And so we're really obsessed with understanding that and then, you know, learning about it and then sharing uh, those learnings with people, and it allows us to have connections. I think as as humans and as you know, as husbands and fathers and wives and sisters and brothers, we all want to connect to each other. We all want to feel like we belong to something. And for us, it's telling the story of food that allows us to connect to our guests, to our employees, to our heritage, our roots. You know, with Middle Terrania, that's um, allowing Michael for the first time ever to connect back to the way he ate every night when he was growing up. And you know, he kind of had to go a long way to do it, right? He went and uh, studied, you know, French cuisine and modern cuisine and expressed himself in a lot of different ways um, throughout the years. But now it's kind of going back to uh, a very rudimentary, you know, uh, beginning. That's, I think it's going to be very special. So we talk about this instantaneous gratification of technology. And we talk about these old traditions of coming together over food. So. How do you, as, as restaurateurs and chefs, find that balance between mm -hmm. technology and tradition and, and the ways that those can interplay? Well, I mean, um, I think that you know, with technology, you, you look at it, obviously, into you know, probably, I would say, three different categories. You look at the first one, which is you know, always the most important to us, is how is anything going to help us connect with our guests? I mean, you know, you asked about our philosophies or what's, what's been kind of the underlying thread of our restaurants throughout all of our restaurants. The one thing that we, from the first restaurant I ever did was called Aqua, and it was in San Francisco on California Street. And, and I had, you know, been in New York, had I'd been working in New York, and, but I was a West Coast person. I was more, uh, my, my mindset was a little more West Coast than East Coast. And you grew up on a, you know, <laughs> Allensburg, Washington. So, and yeah. And, um, and, you know, I always said that we want the same <coughs> level of food, the same level of service that you get in New York. And this was, you know, this was back in 89. We opened in 91. I said, but with kind of the, the, the friendliness of California, the kind of the, the mindset of California, and the goal was always how do you, you know, we look at it and we say, how do you befriend people? How do you um, build long-term relationships with people? Because that's what it's all about. I mean, it, all of it, at the end of the day, it, you know, there's going to be great chefs. There's going to be many more great chefs. Um, it's, it's for, for me, I, I've always never, I said from day one, I'll never build a whisper joint. And a whisper joint to me is a, a restaurant where you go into, and it could be just spectacular. It could be the best food. It could be the best showcase for me to cook, but where people feel like they need to whisper and they feel like that. And there's nothing wrong with those restaurants. It's just not my personality. So I said from day one, that's not what I want. I won't. And so Aqua was a 140 seat restaurant trying to do four star food, four star service with a big, loud, 
bar, and no, and really the city had never seen anything like that at the time. It was it was really um, a different mindset. But and so there was going to always be bumps in the road. So you really had to befriend your customers so that you could kind of understand that energy when you build something where it's so precious. When one little thing goes wrong, all of a sudden it's it it's really. It goes from being a you know a very insignificant problem to a more significant problem. When you create a certain environment of of just really hospitality and you know relaxation, but very high level food, very high level service, I think that it gives you that ability to get people to be part of what you're doing um, for a much longer period of time. It's more accessible. People want to be relaxed. And so technology, in that sense, with our guests, has helped us tremendously. And Patrick can probably talk about it more than me. But you know, we were the first ones you know, when Open Table started. We were the original, one of the original three restaurants where they took our, you know, where uh, from Aqua, they took our reservation papers. And we explained to them how it, you know, how it all worked. And we were part of that from the very beginning. And seeing that as just kind of that very first step of technology of how now all of a sudden we actually had information on our guests. It wasn't just, we always had it, but it was always handwritten you know, after they left. But you know, when you cook a meal for somebody, this is how kind of my first introduction to technology was. You know, um, Mr. Johnson comes in. I cook him a nine course menu, right? Um, he leaves. I have to write it all down. The next time he comes in, I got to remember everything that I cooked for him so I can cook him a different menu. And, and, and really, you know, technology, the, my very first you know, encounter with it was just kind of being able to house everybody's, uh, you know, what, what we were cooking, what people's allergies were, what people's likes and dislikes, what their wine preferences were. All of these kind of things that just make you be able to make your guest feel much more appreciated when they come into your restaurant. So that, that was kind of my first experience with it. And then now it's, you know, now it's unbelievable what you can do. I mean, you can probably talk a little bit more about that. Right. I mean, our philosophy is tech shouldn't re replace touch. Mm -hmm. And we want to use technology as a tool in order to have better experiences for not just our guests, but for our employees and for everybody that's working for us. So we've developed platforms um, where we, the platform we have is called Recipe Exchange, where all of the dishes within the restaurants um, are featured. It allows all the chefs to kind of understand what's going on in all the restaurants, as well as it's a, a training tool for the front of the house employees and the back of the house employees. It you know goes dish, uh, step by step in making a dish, ingredient by ingredient. Um, it, it's you know a very broad tool that allows us to educate and train. Um, so that, that's one of the re ways technology has allowed us to be better. You know, there's um, with Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all the different social media channels, it allows us to kind of broadcast our message and amplify what's going on in the restaurant and help to narrate and tell a story of what the guest experience is going to be like or what the employ employment experience is going to be like. Um, so ultimately, you know, whether it's through training, hiring, um, recruiting, um, you know, guest education, guest engagement, um, follow up with the guests. That's those are all the different ways in which technology helps you become a better operator. So, at the end of the day, a restaurant's only open typically five to six hours uh, for dinner service. It allows you to focus that whole time on the real engagement of human interaction. Yeah, I mean the. The recipe exchange um, it was a great example because I think we were talking earlier about something that you know about your, your, the way you have to look at the way you have to look at technology, the way you have to think about what you're trying to accomplish. We started it ten years ago. Um, we started because I, you know, we realized we were going to expand and we were going to build multiple restaurants. And in in this day and age, with um, with the fact that if you're not using seasonal products and you're not using local products, then you're not really cooking, you know, to the best of your ability because it's just. And so, if you're going to have restaurants all over the country, and if I'm going to say that I actually am involved in the food in all of those restaurants and to truly be involved with that chef who's in Washington D.C., I can't tell him that the 
the menu at Bourbon Steak Washington, D.C. should be the same as the menu at Bourbon Steak San Francisco because they just have different products. They have different seasons. Um, and so to just to approve all of the menus, you know, when, with 26 restaurants, I mean, you're talking about, um, you know, hundreds of recipes a day that come through to me. And so just to, just to be able to collect them, we basically built this, we built Recipe Exchange. And, um, and it, so every time that we do a dish, every time that a chef does a dish, basically runs it for three days at the restaurant, runs it over a weekend. At the end of those three days, if they're still in love with the dish, then they send it to me. And it has um, a photo of the dish, the recipe of the dish, and what dish it's going to replace on the menu. And then, it, and then I'll tell them what I want changed on it or not changed on it or whatever. And then if I approve it, then they'll do the costing of the dish and they'll shoot a video of the dish. And that will all go on to a, this site that we have. And so at 26 restaurants now, and every dish when it comes off gets archived. So there's over 35,000 recipes on the site. And it's all for the employees. 1,800 employees have access to it. Um, there's over 3,000 videos. And um, typically, you know, if you think if you're involved in restaurants at all, technology is very hard to push on chefs. Chefs hate it, you know, it, especially back then. It's yeah. it's changed a lot now, but it, it was very hard to uh, to get it up and going. Yeah, you know, I lost a lot of chefs just committing to doing it, and then over a period of time, we lost a lot of chefs. So, and but what I found at the end of it, when we finally about five years ago. It, it got to where it really worked. And actually, every restaurant used it and actually couldn't survive without it because we shifted it to where our, it's where everybody was training. And it's also where, where we would collect. You know, when we, Even when we were looking at numbers, we were trying to look at numbers and look at food at the same time. So you're looking, if you're looking at you know, your sales on a lobster pot pie, you're actually looking at a lobster pot pie. Even your, even your accounting people, we forced them to look at food and to try to connect it together, just to, just to, it, just to keep everybody on the same mindset of what's important. But, um, but really, what we ended up finding was the same chefs that couldn't keep up their site, you would go into their kitchens, and they were not impeccable kitchens. If they couldn't keep up their site, more than likely they couldn't keep up their kitchen. And it was amazing how true that became. And to this day now, you, now, now it's great because now all the chefs are very competitive so they're all, every, because everybody's looking at each other's food. So now they're really competitive with it and it works really well. <laughs> a huge array of right. benefits, both practical and kind of right. unexpected. And, and I think that speaks to, you, you touched on balance. And as far as running balanced restaurants, you know, you have to run a balanced business. You know, you have to focus on, you know, uh, you know on the, the craft and the art of the cuisine, as well as making sure that it costs out properly. You have to make sure that you're focused on developing talent, as well as retaining top talent. And, you know, just running a balanced business. And you, you find, is that you know leadership uh, is kind of an, an indivisible whole. You can't try to just be great at one element and be a truly great leader. You have to actually try to excel at all of them. And when you see things like a sick, you know, a sick recipe exchange or the, you know the chef's representation is kind of dismal, it speaks to really what's going on throughout the whole rest of the restaurant because there's you know there's a sickness there. There's a, there's an, there's just not that uh, exuberance to be a master or to be a champion of all elements of the restaurant. So you know that there's something funny going on. That's interesting, it being like an indicator of uh -huh. larger. Mm -hmm. So you talked a little bit about atmosphere and what you were trying to do, bringing your personality. I think that that is evident in your partnership with the Levi Stadium and the 49ers. <laughs> maybe that's obviously yeah. a, a, that strikes a fun chord. So yeah. maybe talk a little bit about that experience. Um, well, you know that again, that was one of the restaurants that we did last year, and that was a it was a big project. But um, really, kind of what they what the goal and mission was for Levi Stadium. I am a you know I'm, I'm a big 49ers fan. Have been for 20 plus years, and so. Um, and so when I had the opportunity, it was more of a passion project. I said, you know, this, um, this would be great. Um, yeah, but the 49ers initially said, we've got 6,000 square feet for you. Yeah. You know, do you think you can do something? Would you, would you guys be interested? And so we drove down from San Francisco to meet with the president of the 49ers, Prague Marte. 
and we talked them into now 16,000 square feet of space. <laughs> cool. A bit more yeah. than yeah. 6,000. Yeah. And, and we, you know, we set out to create something that really hadn't been done because, um, the, you know, as far as the restaurant, um, we knew that we wanted to do the pub and the steakhouse. Um, but, you know, really the whole driver um, was to create this kind of environment and this tailgate party that was um, just kind of um, really did. I, I had always thrown these tailgate parties, and um, and I had you know so many chefs when they would come to town, or chefs from here would come, and so everybody would cook courses, and this was out of candlestick, and mm -hmm. literally we would you know roast whole livers of foie gras out at the stadium. I mean, it was crazy. Tailgates what we used to at do. candlestick always, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and so we said you know we want to do something that's completely over the top, and and so you know we created the whole idea of this tailgate party and inviting chefs from different cities whenever we're playing those cities as well as just other chefs that are friends of mine and and then all of this equipment that was really geared for this party and so we built the largest rotisserie indoor rotisserie in the united states and so we roast a whole japanese wagyu cow every game um 1200 pound cow every game we have these cranes with these um, pots that hold 600 gallons of water with these really special induction burners that boil 600 gallons of water. So we take the cranes and drop like 300 lobsters at a time or 150 crabs <laughs> at a time. It's really insane. The, 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 the event is just insane. And, and it just, it's kind of, it was fun. It was just more of a, it was just almost more of, you know, knowing that it would work because it's so, you know, doing things like that just on game days works because you have this very captivated group of people, right, that always want to do something that's over the top. And so we kind of knew that we had the, really had the um, audience for it, but then it was just see how far you could push it, you know, see, see what the limit, limits were. And so we got through our first season and it was, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> Keep raising the bar. <laughs> We're ready for this season now. Getting ready for next year. Yeah. So how far in advance do you guys plan? You have these imaginations? About, so, as soon as the schedule comes out, um, we have to wait for the schedule to come out to know who we're playing. We usually plan the teams that we know we play every year. So we plan those, and then we and then we wait to see who we're playing. And then it just depends on who we play. Because we do about 45 different dishes for each game. And um, in all in different ways. So we have, you know, whether people are, there's walking around, there's outdoors. So we'll bring in people that do, like, like if we're playing against, you know, like this year we're playing against St. Louis, we play every year. And so we're bringing uh, this guy, Michael, from Poppy's Barbecue, which is the best barbecue in the United States. And he's going to do the outdoors. So he'll do the smoker and the outdoors. And then we have another, you know, usually a Michelin starred chef inside. and plus all of us, and, and so it's, uh, it, there's a lot, there's a lot to plan. We typically try to have some connective tissue with the city we're playing, mm -hmm. so that there's, you know, we can kind of tell that story of how they tailgate, mm -hmm. you know, so there's always kind of that San Francisco versus yeah. whoever we're playing uh, within and throw the throw those the challenges yeah. out to your friends. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. It's yeah. fun. Yeah. Oh, it's fun. Yeah. Well, yeah. And this year we have the Super Bowl, so that'll be exciting. Yeah. So are you thinking how you even begin to conceptualize what you're going to do for All the chefs like that? that are coming this year for guest chefs, they're all going to come back and do the Super Bowl with us. So wow. We're going to do a big one for the Super Bowl. Yeah. I can't even imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody in our audience have questions? Several layers of questions, mm -hmm. but <laughs> Very at, at an essence, how do you still manage to cook? How much do you mm -hmm. get to cook? How do you foster innovation with so many different restaurants? And how, uh -huh. how do you remain really injected into sure. it? Sure. Well, there, there's a couple different ways. I mean, um, one thing that I'm always very committed to is when we open a restaurant, um, and my son, who's over there, can be the first to tell you, <laughs> I spend three months at that in that kitchen. And I spend three months running that kitchen just like I was going to be the chef of that restaurant. So that way, whenever I, because usually my work day is throughout most of the day, I'm, I'm doing you know meetings or more of the administrative side. But then at nighttime at 5 o'clock, before service starts, I go to one of the kitchens. 
and then I always want to be able to feel comfortable in that kitchen so I can walk in and, and run the kitchen and do what I would do as if I was the chef of that restaurant. That's why I always spend the first three months there um, and do that job. And so that's how I stay able to go into the kitchen and just be able to, if you were to come in for a dinner if I, and I'm at that restaurant, I could cook for you. Um, that's how I do it. And I try to block everything else out once I'm in the kitchen. I try to keep the phone as away as much as possible and everything else. And then, um, and then um, you know, I cook a lot at home. I set up kind of, I live in a, we live out in uh, Nicasio, out in Marin, and so we grow a lot of product. And then we have our kitchen right next to, you know, the, the kitchen right next to what we grow. And so we, um, we do everything from, um, you know, hosting, but a lot of recipe development, a lot of ideas we'll, we'll do there. But to be honest with you, it's more about your second question, which is, you know, how do you, how do you nurture young chefs and how do you surround yourself with talent is really, the, that's really the answer to the question is at this point um, to keep, to really stay um, relevant, you have to surround yourself with a lot of talent and you have to have very talented people. Traveling is, you know, it, traveling is amazing. It's much better to travel in groups of two or three really talented chefs and so that you're constantly really dissecting everything and questioning everything. and and everything else, but also too, I mean, we're very fortunate at this point because when we wanted to open a Japanese restaurant, um, I love Japanese food. I, I have a good handle on it, but I'm probably just about enough to be dangerous. Um, so I partnered with an amazing Japanese chef. And so not only then could I learn from him, um, he can learn from us, we can learn from him, and then, um, and then all of the people in our company, all of the young, talented chefs in our company, now besides just being able to go on recipe exchange and get these, these recipes and techniques that a great Japanese chef will never show you, <laughs> um, they, keep, they have access to all of them. Um, we all do, and we can also you know, really um, benefit from each other. And that's you know, a big part of it. A big part of it is really just being able to, part of this test kitchen was for that reason and also to let some of our really talented chefs in our company be able to say that, you know, they want to do a pop-up and they want to, you, they've got an idea for a concept, you know, and they want to do one of their concepts and they all get a pitch, Patrick and me on them. And if we like them, bless you, if we like them, <laughs> we'll, we'll let them do it. But, um, you know, it, so I, I would just say that, you know, but the answer is probably the same to both. As far as getting to cook, I, I'm definitely forced the time to do it because that's what I love to do. Um, and then as far as you know, really being able to motivate and build young talent, you have to look at each person and say, you know, wh where do they need the most help with? I mean, I have some chefs that are amazing, amazing cooks. Like if they sit down and cook the two of us dinner, it's going to be the best dinner ever. But if they tried to cook for 50 people at the same time, it's going to be a disaster. So you have to understand how to you know, get them the, the skills that they need to get to their next step in their career. So the question is, <laughs> with opening so many restaurants, mm -hmm. how do you guard against brand exhaustion? Yeah. I can tell you, I think it's more, that's more of a geographic issue because um, I think that in the Bay Area, we've try, we're trying very hard right now to create, if we're opening more restaurants, we're doing them with like what we just did, like with Ken, where we partnered with an, another chef, or it's, it's, they're different concepts, completely different concepts, right? The only two that are the same are the, you know, is bourbon steak in Santa Clara and bourbon steak in San Francisco. So if it's not a different concept, we won't do it. But um, you know, a lot of times we're going to cities like, you know, when we go to a city, we don't go to a city and say, okay, we want to build another restaurant. We go to a city and say we want to compete at the very highest level. If we're going to go to Washington, D.C. and build a restaurant, we want to compete. We want it to be known as one of the best restaurants in Washington, D.C. And so, you know, the two markets where we have 
the, mo the majority of our restaurants are San Francisco because it's home, and then Las Vegas because it's Las Vegas. And, and Las Vegas is just so much different. Each casino is its own, it's really its own city. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like just really looking at them, they're, they're all kind of their own cities. But, um, you know, um, I, I, I think that I don't know if I, um, I don't know if there's an answer to that question. The answer is, I, I can tell you that we're, um, as you know, we're looking at making sure we have the ability to open great restaurants. If we don't, then we won't do it. If whenever we get to a period of time where where we don't have the infrastructure to do it, we usually take a break and we and we re, we, we rebuild infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think to piggyback on that, we want to have restaurants of consequence, right? So we don't want to just, you know, loosely open up a bunch of restaurants, stick our name on it, and then let them run themselves. We're very uh, intimately involved in the day-to-day -day operations. We're intimately involved in the, the, you know, kind of nurturing the talent, working with the chefs, working with the GMs, the leadership team, the SOMs, the bartenders, and making sure that we're thoughtfully curating the experience, you know, from the kitchen all the way to the front where the, the hostess greets you as well as the technologies that surround how to accentuate that experience. So we're, real, we're just not kind of you know, going out and putting our name on things. We're actually actively pursuing um, you know, being a champion of, of that restaurant within whatever market it's in and making sure that it, it can be competitive and considered one of the best in that, you know, that, in that city or that, in that area. Um, so you know, having that spirit it is one way to help fight against kind of exhaustion or saturation. Another is you know, what we spoke about earlier is just is talent, is making sure that we're constantly trying to work with some of the most talented individuals that we're constantly challenging them, that we're setting the expectation by uh, through being role models in how we conduct ourselves in the restaurants and how we kind of set the example with the openings. Um, and let them know what the, the expected pace is of the operation and what the expected spirit is of, uh, of the operation and then hold them very much to it while empowering them and inspiring them to be able to kind of innovate on their own. And, and you know, it's kind of a, a, a give and take. You know, at first it's a lot of MENA group kind of um, putting in systems and um, guiding the restaurant. And as we have a stronger relationship with the chef and the general manager, they get a lot more autonomy and a lot more empowerment to kind of creatively flex their, their muscles. And then pretty soon it's, it's kind of their show with us as almost like conciliaries or you know, gu guidance counselors to help them you know, maximize what they're trying to achieve. Um, and then again, it's by having these unique kind of different things like the Mina Test Kitchen, where it's a, you know it's an opportunity for people to to showcase their talents and to you know kind of think outside of the uh, outside of the box and get involved in something that they might not never never get exposed to. What is your process for conceptualizing a new restaurant? How does that mm -hmm. creatively start for you guys? Um, well, I mean, really the biggest. Um, piece of it is something we're passionate about. I mean, um, we've never really done anything just based on looking at it and saying, well, you know, we know that this is financially going to make a lot of sense. Almost to a fault. Yeah. Like you're obsessed with ramen, maybe. Right. Yeah. Well, we were, yeah, we were upset. <laughs> He's obsessed Me with ramen. Me or son is obsessed with ramen. <laughs> but we were obsessed with, you know, uh, Japanese cooking. Mm -hmm. And that's why we did Pabu. And then ramen bar was something that our partner, Ken, wanted to do. Um, he had always wanted to do it. And he had always wanted to, but he didn't know how to do it. And so we said, you know, let's, let's do it together. Let's, let's help you on how to, how to facilitate it, how to be able to actually feed people, you know, and, and um, in that style that he wanted to do it. And, and so, but, um, you know, as far as selecting the concept, um, it's usually Patrick and myself. We usually, you know, start to talk about something a cuisine that we love, but then we start to really think about how would how would we create a concept that would be ours. It's not just about like you go to Pabu. It's much different than most than a lot of other Japanese restaurants you're going to go to in the city, and that's what we still want to be able to put our own stamp on whatever it is that we do. And uh, the this kind of Eastern Mediterranean 
the pop-up will put our own stamp on, but we already have plans, hopefully if the pop-up goes well, of what the restaurant will be like, and that will definitely put our own stamp on it. Mm -hmm. And so that, you know, if the passion is there, then it just always is a better concept. The, the pricing strategy that we have with, with wine in particular, um, it's, it, it, it varies. It's kind of a, a flexible or dynamic pricing strategy based on what we feel are going to be workhorse wines that will help contribute to overall cost, um, as well as then kind of higher end wines like you're talking about that aren't good cost leaders, but they're, you know, they're good for margin. Um, but you know, we're in a retail store, you think about it when you're going, you're buying wine off the shelf in the retail. We, we pay those same prices that you're getting from a retailer. Maybe we might pay a dollar or two less per bottle. So if you're buying a bottle of wine from a retailer, you're buying it for $50, we might be buying it for $47, $47.50. Um, but you're taking it home. We have a, a staff of people that are, you know, one, we're you know, receiving the wine, we're properly storing the wine, we're educated about the wine, um, they're opening it up, you know, they're paying for glassware, paying for china, paying for silverware. There's a lot of other expenses that go into kind of that, uh, that cost factor for the, for the wine. Um, you know, with intoxicants uh, such as beer, wine, liquor, you, you don't have a huge threshold for volume. Um, because people get drunk and then they, they can't conduct themselves in uh, socially acceptable behavior, um, as well as we have um, a limited seat count, right? So there's just, it, we, we're kind of, um, we're, uh, you know, uh, narrow it in on exactly how much throughput with volume we can get. So you've got to try to maximize the uh, profitability you're going to have when you mark up stuff like liquor, beer, and wine. You know, it's, it's, what's funny is, you know, people kind of hem and haw about the prices uh, for wine and liquor um, in, in restaurants. But, you know, restaurants as a general business aren't profitable businesses, um, especially here in San Francisco or the Bay Area. I mean, it's extremely hard to make a profit. Um, our restaurants are probably some of the top revenue restaurants uh, in the city, and we, we constantly, um, we, there's ebbs and flows with how well we do just because of the cost of rent, the cost of you know, health uh, benefits, the uh, healthy SF surcharges, um, the minimum wage that's increasing, all these different um, things that we have to kind of cover. And on top of it, San Francisco's um, very controlled with what we can charge for food and you know it's very competitive and everybody's hyper critical and hyper aware and hyper vocal as far as what the pricing structure is so we, we kind of have handcuffs with that so we try you know to uh, really make most of our money through the you know the selling of liquor beer and wine um, we do have on all of our wine lists a couple different sections um, one it, that allows us to kind of go and find Great wines that probably, if they were more known, would be you know through the roof with pricing. But we try to keep those priced under seventy dollars. So we tend to have um, typically about fifty wines on all of our wine lists that are kind of these we call them hidden gems or back road wines that you our psalms through their travels find out from. It's often like the second label from a, a well known producer or that that type of stuff. So we always try to add value to the wine list with those, um, as well as. Um, in some of the restaurants, we'll do kind of uh, on one night of the week, like a Sunday or Monday, try to do an industry night, but really it's for everybody where all the wines on the wine list are half off. Um, so we try to you know, kind of augment um, the, the pricing and give some good value um, through different types of promotions and different types of fines. So how do you build a culture where it's okay to iterate quickly, uh -huh. fail fast, as we say here, uh -huh. here at Google, where that's okay, because right. it's a scary concept right. in general? Hopefully, uh, not everybody that works for us will see this. But, um, <laughs> there, you know, there's there's a handful of people in our you know kind of in our top level executive core, and and we kind of yeah I, I kind of feel like you need it a little bit. Um, there's a handful of people that will constantly want to question, you know, really deeply question, and and in a way, um, will say you know just that pr proceed with caution type experience. And then, but what I think is really important for me personally, I've found is that myself and Patrick, you know, the two top people in the company, 
just are relentless with more innovation. More innovation, more creativity, more um, just like the, when the day comes that the two of us you know, say no, we just don't. We'll like try something. We'll find a way to test it safely, I guess would probably be what you're asking. And for us, it's a little bit different because you know, we don't have to, <laughs> I'm sure for, for your company, when you have to test something, you have to test it on so many people to really get a, a sense of it. But for us, like, we can run a special in a restaurant when it comes to food, right? We can, we can, we can run um, different dishes, we can try different things. Um, we can try things um, um, in where it gets really tricky is obviously when you're opening a restaurant and you have a full concept and then then it's you know um, we you know we've, we've had one philosophy since the beginning and that's the fact that a restaurant is better or worse every day than it was the day before and so today, my restaurant in San Francisco will be better or worse than it was yesterday. It's actually impossible to stay the same. It's 100% impossible. So you, you can't, you know, if you're striving to stay the same, you're going to get worse. There's no doubt you're going to get complacent. The restaurant's going to get worse. And so innovation is a huge part of that. Um, finding that good balance of being constantly trying to innovate, um, but uh, really understanding that you're trying to to take anything like I, I the biggest thing that I'll say to chefs is um, if you if you're not creating the next signature dish if you're not creating the next dish that likely we can never take off the menu then you're not creating the next dish you shouldn't create the next dish if in your mind you're not going to create a signature dish if you're ever going to create a filler dish in the menu don't bother. Just because don't bother saying that it's a salad, so we have to have a salad on the menu because it's actually not true. You don't. You you have, you have to obsess over that salad and figure out how to create the absolute best salad. And then when it gets to you know full concepts and and that's when I think it gets to be really fun for us is because then it's how do you put the whole creative process together from the design to the menus to the style of service to the beverage program to the to the you know just the the actual heart and soul and DNA of the restaurant and um, and I think that you know getting back to the fact that if you're not you know if you're not constantly trying to push and constantly thinking about not it's not even just what you're doing it's obviously what everybody else is doing if you're not in tune to what everybody else is doing and you're not trying to push to, to move forward, it's pretty hard to stay relevant. Um, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, you know, um, our, my philosophy on, uh, on failure has kind of changed because of this, uh, the new generation of, of leaders that we have kind of coming up through the ranks and, um, you know, the millennial generation of workers. And, um, you know, our role is to you know, really to teach people how to fail and to to it, to be okay with it. Because as soon as you're okay with failure, you can have a lot of fun with what you're doing. If you're afraid to fail, you're afraid to make decisions, and you're afraid to fully engage. Um, and so, a lot of times, I look for opportunities. Um, you know, are you know, uh, look for. Um, not necessarily. I know someone's going to fail, but if they fail, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. It's not going to. You know, it's not life or death. It's you know. It's. Um, but we. I have to make sure that they're learning from that. You know that um, if they make a mistake or there is a failure, that they, that they learn from it and that they try to figure out. You know how to kind of overcome it. You know, and there's always a reason. If it's whether I didn't work hard enough, I you know, or we didn't put enough time into something, or I was you know ill-conceived, or you know it, it just was flat out the wrong idea. As long as they're kind of taking that uh, you know lesson from from the failure, then they're going to continue to kind of innovate and be better and better. Um, and it's like I said, right now we've got a very young team, uh, so we're we're let you know we're putting a lot of empowerment on them, and it's kind of fun to see them um, to go out and fail at some stuff, and then they're but they're really quick to kind of correct themselves and, and pick themselves up and try to you know figure out what, what they did wrong and how to improve from it. So Yeah, you're playing with that concept a little bit with the Mina Test kitchen right. too, right? Yeah. Shrink the field, reduce mm -hmm. the risk a little, let it iterate. Exactly. Right. And we and, and we can we can adapt and change quickly. Yeah. So 
very in alignment with Google's yeah. culture. But and I think a lot of it is what Patrick just said as far as like, you know, um, how passionate is the person who's trying to do it? You know, I mean, like I'll, I'll have chefs that will you know, talk to me about a dish that they want to do, and I can tell in five minutes how passionate they are about the dish, or if it's just because the other dish is out of season and they need to change something, right? And, you know, the passion has so much to do with it, and obviously you can't, you can't let the passion be dangerous. It can't be somebody <laughs> that's got all passion and doesn't have the knowledge <laughs> to, to balance them out, but I think that that's kind of where the balance comes is, you know, how much passion and how much knowledge and how much, you know, you can, if they're passionate, they've really done the research, they have the knowledge, chances are it's a, it's a pretty good bet to let them try. Um, and if they fail, they fail. You know, you just, <laughs> you, right. you have to. I've, we've, we've had, you know, our most, our most creative concept failed. And it was something that killed both of us. We worked on it so hard, and it's to this day was the best thing we ever did, and it failed. Which was that? What? <laughs> it was called 14, and it was in Los Angeles. And so we have a lot of theories of why it failed. <laughs> wrong, wrong place, wrong time. Wrong place, wrong time. But it was truly the best thing we ever did. Um, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, and it was, it was the hardest thing we ever did, and it was the most creative thing we ever did, and it might have, you know, just you know, like I said, maybe it's the wrong place, wrong time, maybe it's too creative. But I tell you one thing, what we learned out of that, we've had probably 10 successes from there. And probably the biggest thing we learned is, like if we were athletes, we would have pushed ourselves to a point where we, 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 we created so much stamina, the next restaurant <laughs> seemed so easy after that one. So if it was really maybe wrong place, wrong time, do you think you'll ever bring it back to life, a new iteration? I, I, don't, I don't know, you know, it was one of those things where I felt, I kind of feel like it needed to catch magic at that time because, mm -hmm. because it didn't, I don't know if we could get the amount of, you know, Buy in and pass. It could be a test kitchen uh, on yeah. cue for the test kitchen. I don't know. Could be. We may. You never know. We might resurrect it there. <laughs> Maybe for our 25th anniversary, <laughs> working together, so maybe we bring it back. Oh, favorite places to travel for food. Wait, I need to make a list. <laughs> I mean, obviously Europe is is great because um, you know there's they're just so rooted um, through history with the, the different regions of Italy have different ways to cook pasta or different ways to cook pizza, for that matter, and to understand why they arrived at those ways or how they got to those destinations. You know, um, France, you know, Spain. Spain right now is extremely um, innovative in what they're doing. They're, to go to Spain and to see um, the, the classic traditional um, you know, cooking to all the way up to what Ferran Adria was doing at El Bouilly or even some of the other, you know, chefs like at Salada Con Roca um, is just, it's mind boggling and how much creativity and innovation is coming out of, of that region of the world. But then to go, you know, hop, skip it and jump away to Greece and just be able to ha pick out a piece of fish and have it perfectly cooked as you're sitting um, next to the water in the Aegean Sea are that, you know, is, is pretty remarkable as well. So, there, I mean, mm -hmm. I, you know, there's a lot of different, you know, learnings to, to be had. I, I love going to Europe personally. I, I like going to, you know, Asia, Japan. Um, it, for me, you know, what was great about Japan was it's very modern and it's very Western. However, it's still very preserved. Whereas you go to somewhere like Hong Kong, um, it's very Western and not very preserved, right? It's, uh, it feels like you could be in Manhattan, where it, when you're in Tokyo, it feels like you're in Tokyo. Mm -hmm. um, so I always like to have that type of authenticity yeah. as part of travel as well. Yeah, and I think that a good rule of thumb is the food you love, the food you're most passionate about eating, is probably going to be, you know, you, you might in certain ways feel like, oh, you know, I love Japanese food but I eat so much of it that I don't need to go to Japan. But when you go to Japan and you eat Japanese food and you really understand the culture and why you love it so much, I mean, it, you know, that's, to me, that's what it's all about. It's like, you know, when we went to the Middle East, um, you know, there's, it, it, what's there is the spices. I mean, when you start to see the spices, and so you travel to different places for different reasons. But if you're, you know, if you're really kind of, want to travel based on food. I would, you know, I wouldn't just do it because there's great food in Greece if if that's, you know, if you're only got a few trips, go to where you go to go to the places where you absolutely love that cuisine. 
and, you, and then spend the time doing the research before you get there to, to get the right places to go, to go see. And you'll, you'll have such an appreciation for it when you get back. But Tokyo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what about closer to home? Where's your favorite place to eat in the US that's not one of your restaurants? This, um, you know, it, again, it kind of depends on, um, it depends on what level you're looking to dine. You know, I would say in the city, um, if I want to go out to something that I'm going to, that's going to stimulate me, I'll go to Cezanne. Um, he, uh, Josh, he, he worked, we worked together, he worked for me for a while. Um, he, I've always thought that his, his food was amazing when he worked with us, and now what he's done there is, I, I, you know, I, I'd say that's probably my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, in the city, um, Bennu is really good because it's interesting. It's different. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, uh, um, I mean, there's so many great restaurants right now in San Francisco. Yeah. It's, there, I mean, you have all the way. That's you know, those are obviously three star, three Michelin star restaurants. Yeah. And then there's like little places like Italian Homemade on Columbus, right on the outskirts yeah. of North Beach, where it's a husband and wife from Italy that are making hand. You know, made from scratch, hand, you know, handmade pastas, great sauces. It's like nine dollars. You go through, and I mean, and they're, they're, I mean, they, everybody's Italian in there. You feel like you're Italian when you get in there. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's a, an amazing kind of authentic experience. That's what's great about San Francisco is you've got that range. But it, I mean, this is such a great city. I mean, even if when, you know when you live there, um, to just kind of newly discover different restaurants and different finds. Um, that were right under your nose, but you know, Los Angeles is also a fun city. Um, and that's an up and coming food scene. Seattle, Portland, you know, those Seattle, Portland, Los Angeles um, is also part of the you know it, it, another kind of enigma as far as you know we're we're you know with our st with kind of the staffing dilemma that we have here in San Francisco, which could be another talk. Yeah. Um, but those are all three great West Coast cities to see a lot of. Good indigenous cooking, but as well uh, as well as some good global cooking. So, how did you yeah. decide to expand from your one Michael Mena? Yeah, that's a you know that's a great question because that's um, not only a question; it's been something that chefs have had to deal with for a long time. And I have a very I I have a very strong feeling about that. Um, there's nothing wrong with either one. Um, and that's my very strong theory about it, is people have, it, it, it really used to upset me when I was, um, I waited a long time, like I had Aqua for nine years before I opened a second restaurant, but it really upset me when I opened the second restaurant reading the press, because I thought it was some of the most unfair press that I've ever seen, and it wasn't just me, it was every chef that was opening a second, a third, or a fourth restaurant back then, back in 98, 99, 2000, that's when it kind of started happening where chefs that actually said they would never open a second restaurant started opening multiple restaurants, right? And I think that the press and people had really, um, had really boxed chefs in, had forced chefs. I, there are so many chefs that I can tell you that unfortunately I've seen them work for, partner with a lawyer, a, a business person, and that person became a restaurateur. Mm -hmm. The person that funded the restaurant then started becoming a restaurateur and the chef, and it was okay for that person to go out and open multiple restaurants, but it wasn't okay for the chef to open multiple restaurants, and it really affected the quality of the food here. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that both ways are fine, but the quality of food in the United States over the last 10 years, since chefs started really becoming restaurateurs, and you see chefs like Thomas Keller, who mm -hmm. you know, for a long time said he was just gonna have one restaurant, and op but opened, it has opened now multiple restaurants, and every one of them is amazing. They're amazing restaurants. And not only are they amazing restaurants, the passion that's in those kitchens allows all these other chefs to become amazing chefs. So the more great kitchens that you have, the more great chefs you're gonna have, the better food you're gonna have in your country. And so I'm, I'm really, I, I, there, neither way is wrong. 
I chose my decision because I wanted all the guys that worked in my kitchen to get their own kitchens. And so I wanted, I didn't want to lose them, I wanted them to keep growing. And a lot of them now do have their own kitchens and a lot of them have, were chefs for me and they've gone on to own their own restaurants or even own their own restaurant companies. But I feel like, I feel like um, there's nothing, um, it was one of, it was a situation that um, back in, you know, the late 90s, it was a big topic. It was a big topic when chefs started opening more than one restaurant about how you're not cooking at your restaurant and you're not doing this. And, and at the end of the day, you've got to judge a restaurant by what you eat. You have to. You have to judge it by what you eat, what your service is, what, what it is. And so if there is, if you're, um, you know, if there is a really talented team of people back there cooking, you're still going to eat really good food at that restaurant. And hopefully there'll just be more great restaurants, which I think that, you know, this, um, it, right now, this, this day and age, you, you just see it. You see so many chefs now that have multiple restaurants and, you know, they've, they've really, they have great restaurants. You, and you want them to, I want them to keep opening more restaurants because I want there to be more great restaurants. Me? Two. <laughs> Amen to that. Our, our time is up. I'm so sorry. I've had such a great time talking with you, but thank you guys. For thank coming. you.